everybody to our faculty lecture series. And um, uh, yeah, thank you for being here. I'm the last minute moderator for this um, session. And um, just to remind you that we have these uh, lecture series every semester and um, we have our final lecture series next Friday as well. So um, thanks to those of you who have been attending these series um, regularly. Uh, we really appreciate that. And then uh, with uh, next Friday being our last uh, series, um, we will take a pause and then we will return uh, uh, in fall again with uh, brand new lectures um, given by faculty from across both campuses here. So today I'm going to introduce uh, Jacob Polanski, uh, who is a doctoral researcher at the University of Sussex, uh, where he's studying the socio-economic impact of cross-border markets along the Afghan Tajik border. Um, Jacob graduated from Amsterdam University College in economics and law and obtained a master's degree in economics from the School of Slavonic and East European Studies at University College London. Uh, Jacob also studied at Al Farabi Kazakh National University in Almaty as an undergraduate exchange student and completed two summer school programs um, at Sciences Po Paris. And during the 2019 uh, 2020 academic year, he also spent a year at UCA Korok as a visiting researcher and a teaching assistant. And um, as you can see from his slide, today he's going to give us a talk uh, titled Gendered Energy Relations at the Crossroads of Asia, Electrification, Empowerment, and Mixed Outcomes in Northeastern Afghanistan. Uh, so with that, I will give the floor to Jacob. And uh, if you have any questions, uh, know that we have a Q&A at the very end of the session. So you can hold on to your questions until the end or simply write them in the chat box and I'll make sure that they will get posted at the end of the lecture. Thank you, everyone. Jacob, the floor is yours. Thanks, Samas. Uh, welcome, everyone. Um, just a quick question, if you could nod, if you can see my screen. Perfect. Um, so I'm going to present a paper I wrote jointly with Murat Beck on electrification efforts in northeastern Afghanistan. And in this paper, we asked ourselves how having access to reliable electricity impacts livelihoods and whether and or to what degree these effects uh, differ for women and men. We use Shuhnan, a district in the Badakhshan province of Afghanistan as the case study. Um, we find that electrification actually does improve living standards, although to varying degrees for those um, you know, who are of the male and of those uh, who are of the female gender. Um, generally speaking, households with grid electricity have higher incomes on average, but more importantly, women in those communities benefit from time savings, improved education, and healthcare outcomes. We also find that switching from off-grid solutions to grid-supplied electricity allows households to significantly increase energy usage at no additional cost. So how did we get to study this area? Um, Pamir Energy, a public-private partnership between the IFC and ACFED, is a major energy producer in the gorno badakhshan Autonomous Oblast in Tajikistan. At the time of writing, they operated 11 HPPs, a hydropower plants, with an output of some 40 megawatts. But this number is actually ever increasing as they are constructing new HPPs, such as the HPP Sebzor, to improve their coverage and to reach the most vulnerable and most remote areas in the Pamir Mountains. Starting in 2008, they built cross-border transmission lines to Afghanistan, and since then, they supply energy to multiple districts in the Badakhshan province, where they service approximately 5,000 customers, which translates to a population of over 50,000 people. In our research, we are specifically looking at the Shugnan district um, and compare communities which have been connected to the electricity grid for approximately 10 years with communities which only had access to off-grid solutions. These off-grid solutions included low-quality obsolete solar panels, improvised microhydro generators, car batteries, which were completely unreliable and have very low capacities. They would often break down, require costly repairs, and expose their users to life-threatening dangers as they were mostly installed by, um, were not installed by professionals. Looking at the existing body of literature, we noticed that there is no consensus on whether electrification uh, benefits women or not. 
Evidence was very mixed with some studies claiming no positive effects and others praising electrification for disproportionately improving women's health, education and economic outcomes. The quote by Dr. Reval summarizes it pretty well. Information on whether women benefit when they gain access to improved energy sources is mostly mixed, minimal or unclear. However, what we know is that regardless of whether the effect was positive or negative, it was different for women compared to men. And hence, any interventions must therefore take women's specific needs for energy use into account. Um, now I'm going to take you through a few um, theoretical mechanisms, um, how electrification impacts uh, health, education, and economic outcomes. So with regards to education, there is vast evidence for a positive effect on attendance as well as on performance but quantitative uh, longitudinal studies have yet to be carried out. So most of what we know comes from small sample qualitative or cross-sectional research. Attendance can improve as a result of uh, freed up time following the simplification of tasks which women were culturally obliged to carry out, such as unpaid domestic work and biomass collection. In some cases, women also felt safer walking on streets following the installation of lights. Performance can improve due to improved study environments or as a result of increased study time at home facilitated by the availability of electric lights. But education attainment is also further facilitated by gaining access to modern communication methods such as internet, TV, cell phones, which often induce changes that are beyond uh, formal academic education, but also um, venture into social norms. Health benefits um, are pretty manifold for women. Um, however, the most direct benefit following the introduction of electricity is the use uh, of electricity for cooking purposes and thereby the reduction of exposure to fumes and pollutants from biomass burning. While household air pollution might seem marginal, due to prevalent gender role, it uh, disproportionately affects women and causes more deaths annually. And this is really important. It causes more deaths annually than malaria, tuberculosis or AIDS. The collection and use of biomass is also linked to plenty of accidents, uh, deformations and burns. And if you look on the other hand, electrification on the community level also allows for the introduction of um, modern um, medical methods, including diagnostic tools such as x-rays, uh, refrigerators for vaccines and um, telemedicine programs, for example, which I will talk about later. Um, there's also um, the aforementioned changes in social norms following the exposure to, for example, uh, TV programs, which have actually robustly shown to decrease fertility rates and increase the awareness of women's rights, including reproductive rights. With the use of cell phones, women can also discreetly consult relatives or specialists when they are ill or in danger. And one last point uh, to point out is that using kettles, um, one can purify water in areas where drinking water is not safe. And this obviously has positive health benefits as well. With regards to economic outcomes, uh, the underlying mechanism can be twofold. Either active daytime can get extended for the use of electric lights or electric appliances can decrease the time needed to carry out the same task using traditional methods. However, what we see is um, that for women, electrification doesn't reduce drudgery, but rather allows women to take up additional tasks due to the extended capabilities. Furthermore, a major impediment that we find in literature and also in our uh, uh, research is that in patriarchal societies, um, cultural norms remain as an impediment as a result of which women, um, let's say, men often interfere with uh, women become, uh, becoming economically active. And um, before I start telling you about our results, just um, a few words on our methodology and data. So we employed the Shunan Electrification Survey. Um, field work was conducted in 2018 and we surveyed some 60 households, 30 of which were in electrified and 30 uh, households were in non-electrified communities. This is obviously not representative on any level, but provides a snapshot of the current situation. And we are not trying to prove uh, any causality. So any findings that we have, please take them with a pinch of salt. 
Um, this final data, cell, uh, data set, um, however, is very rich and we have actually over 600 variables um, on those 60 households. In addition to those uh, household surveys employed, this paper draws also from in-depth interviews with uh, key stakeholders such as school principals and directors of health centers. Uh, the communities were sampled as to be of similar size and geographic location. And we can actually see that the uh, households are quite similar in their demographic makeup. Um, now to the results. Um, so how does uh, access to reliable electricity impact cooking and heating practices? Off-grid households were not using any electric appliances to facilitate cooking and rather relied on firewood and dung as the main energy sources. Even those with grid supplied electricity were mostly using dung instead of electricity for cooking. This fuel stacking led to a shift towards cooking indoors more frequently rather than just during winter months. And given that only the richest households had a separate kitchen, this led to a higher exposure to fumes and household air pollution. Um, why were they not using uh, exclusively electricity when they already had access to reliable electricity? Well, this was due to the high cost of electricity itself, as well as the cost of appliances and the traditions which sort of prescribe the use of biomass, especially with regards to um, a, the status of a woman. Um, heating was also predominantly done by burning biomass. However, uh, the sources uh, differ between electrified and non-electrified communities with the former using mostly dung and the latter uh, firewoods to heat their homes. Um, all households um, had electric lights, regardless of the grid connection status, yet those using solar panels and those micro hydropower plants were waking up tangibly earlier and went to bed earlier too. Um, we find that this may be due to the lower ownership rates of televisions, as well as electricity rationing and disruptions. Overall, um, households in non-electrified communities were 10 times less likely to perform any tasks after sunset. The ownership rates of other ICD devices was also twice as low, and we observed almost a universal switch from radio to TV use. So that's why um, I wrote on the PowerPoint that video killed the radio star because households still had radios at home, but they were just simply not using it. They would rather gather um, with uh, other households to watch television if they didn't have a TV at home themselves. Um, internet remains very costly, both for the high prices of smartphones, as well as uh, for the high price of uh, data plans and the low coverage in the area. Um, a few years ago, people were still using Tajik SIM cards in the borderlands, but this has been recently outlawed due to security concerns. Now, one could think that using grid electricity will be reserved just for a few privileged households. And if you look only superficially at how much households are exp uh, expending for grid electricity, um, one would notice that they spend actually almost twice as much money on electricity as households in non-electrified communities. However, one must consider that those off the grid are still facing relatively high costs for repairs and maintenance, just in order to have very unreliable and very low capacity access to some form of electrical power. In fact, we found that if off-grid households switch to grid supplied solutions, they could power 4,200 hours of LED lights, 1,300 hours of TV, or 55 hours of hot plate usage at no additional costs. This constitutes a major benefit given that off-grid households face up to three months of no electricity access each year during winter months. And even during the warm weather conditions, so in the summer months, they face disruptions twice as long as those with grid supplied electricity. Looking at um, education, <laughs> Um, access to reliable electricity translates to an overall more literate and more educated population. Women in particular are benefiting more than men in this process, and only half as many women have no education. Literacy rates were up by 27% and more women obtain a secondary degree in electrified communities. Female pupils we found were also um, more likely to study at home and um, study 
longer. However, what we found was that they proportionally spend less time than their male peers. Um, we couldn't explain this, but it's an observation that we made and we wanted to report it. With regards to health, um, we need to discuss the household level and the community level effects separately. On the household level, both genders benefit from lower incidence of self-reported ailments and diseases in general. However, respiratory diseases are the one notable exception, which occurs more often in electrified households. This may seem contradictory, but I would like everyone to recall that despite the ownership and partial use of electric cooking appliances, these households still predominantly use biomass for cooking. But given that they have some electric appliances, they largely move their cooking indoors even during summer months, exposing the women to more exhaust and fumes, which are driving the higher incidence of respiratory diseases. Another observation was uh, the lower birth rate in electrified communities. At the same time, the share of stillbirths and the rate of neonatal and infant mortality was also lower in the electrified households. This could be explained by the geographical proximity to the next health center, which truth be told, the electrified households are closer to, but there are suggestions that improves communication technology, cell phones, and being better informed as a result of the media exposure account for some of the differences that we observe. Um, on the community level, we have to mention the transformative changes electrification in, uh, induced on the community health center in the district capital. Prior to having electricity, um, grid electricity, the CHC was relying on a costly and very polluting diesel generator, which provided power for only nine hours a day, six of which during the day, three hours at night, and there were no refrigerators. Um, many perishable medicine and vaccines had to be cooled in ice boxes with snow that had to be collected in the mountains and manually carried from very high altitudes. Um, diagnostic devices were also rather limited. Now, um, a few years later, the CHC operates an echocardiogram, they have an ultrasound, they have x-ray machines, as well as laboratory devices such as centrifuges. Another health center has been also equipped with an upgraded operation room and a laboratory capable of performing basic uh, blood and urine tests since electrification. With the availability of those refrigerators, as uh, mentioned earlier, the CHC is also stocking four additional types of temperature sensitive vaccines. Overall, we see that um, the health centers were able to reach a larger population and increase its capacity. While on average in 2012, um, only 30 to 40 patients visited the clinic. The number grew to 40 to 50 patients uh, in 2015 and to 80 patients in 2017. At the same time, the maternal mortality rates fell from um, 10 per year to zero in the same time span. Neonatal deaths decreased by half as well. And um, this is due to the availability of oxygen masks, um, the ability to sterilize and disinfect equipment as well as the delivery rooms and by um, having the ability to perform cesarean sections tra by trained obstetricians and midwives. What we found also that was that delivering under medical supervision increased the vaccination rates of newborns and the rates are actually higher in um, communities uh, that have access to electricity. Last but not least, um, thanks to the eHealth and telemedicine program, um, the rural health centers can connect with colleagues in larger cities or even abroad to discuss the appropriate treatment for patients. Um, the last topic that I would like to discuss before uh, concluding is the time use and economic empowerment. And um, we find that Actually, what we observe is a significantly um, lower income and um, a smaller share of household heads that were formerly employed in non-electrified communities. Um, at the same time, we find that expenditure on food products was relatively constant, regardless of the status of electrification. This is uh, reflected in the fact that um, off-grid households, as we can see on the chart as well, 
have to expend almost three times as much money they earn in income on food, which dramatically um, drives the level of indebtedness. Um, interestingly, the amount owed is similar to grid connected households. And it implies that while there will be a similar limit on borrowing based on assets, non-electrified households expend their borrowed money on food while others use it to purchase appliances or improve their homes or spend the uh, borrowed money on uh, festivities. Contrary to our expectations, we do not find much evidence uh, for significant general time savings um, other than related to collection of water, which is in the domain of women. Um, and um, this is probably due to having a higher probability of having piped water access in electrified communities with water pumps uh, available. Um, nevertheless, uh, men in grid connected communities spend significantly less time on wood collection um, as a preferred alternative energy source to electricity is dung in electrified households. And as a result of that, they spend more time on childcare and even participated more often in tasks that are considered to be traditionally in the domain of women. We also found that um, businesses um, were equipped with electric lights and were able to operate on average 25% longer or some two hours. And uh, some shopkeepers were able to purchase uh, fridges and hence uh, were equipped to sell perishable goods. In conclusion, we find positive effects in education and general health. Um, we established that switching to clean and reliable electricity would come at no additional cost to users and at the same time would provide them with sufficient energy to power some 4,200 hours of LED light, the 1,300 hours of TV usage or 55 hours of half light usage. And that is um, plenty enough for the needs of those households. Um, there is evidence uh, suggesting higher household incomes by a factor of almost six in electrified communities compared to those using solar panels. And at the same time, um, 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 saving from uh, the time saving from not having to collect firewood makes men more likely to engage um, in the household. Yet we also find some or we make some observations that are where that we didn't expect that were contrary to our um, expectations. Uh, we find that women are less likely to leave the household, which we cannot fully explain, and that they have less decision making power with regards to making household purchases in electrified communities. We believe that this is because of the relatively higher value of the purchases made in electrified households. Um, and hence, the larger the value, the more of a say would uh, the male household that have uh, compared to the uh, women of the household. Also, as discussed earlier, we observe um, this contradictory higher incidence of respiratory, respiratory health issues as a result of a shift towards indoor cooking accompanied uh, with a lack of clean cooking methods indoors. Um, we therefore want to stress that providing electricity alone is not going to improve women's situation, but that structural changes and access to broader financial resources are needed. Um, there's a quote by Dr. Winter and her colleagues um, that electricity can be an enabling factor for a women's empowerment, but not a goal in itself. And I think me and Murenbeck very much um, identify with this statement. So uh, having said this, I would like to thank you for your attention and I would like to open now a discussion. Feel free to ask me anything about the uh, fieldwork process, the data, um, our findings. Um, I welcome any feedback or critical questions. So Maz, if you, if, if you were so kind to maybe moderate this, that would be great. Great, right. thank you so much, Jacob, for this. Super interesting study. I have a lot of questions, um, but um, before we get into the q and I'm just gonna send you guys um, a link to the paper by Jacob and Marat Beck on this very specific topic. You can take a look at it, it's in the chat box for those of you who are interested to learn more about this study. You can, um, you can download the paper. Um, and I also see that Morad Beck has joined us, and I am going to actually give the floor to Morad Beck to uh, moderate the rest of this talk. 
Thanks. Thanks very much, Somas. One thing um, that I want to add, for those of you who might not have university uh, library access to the journal in which we publish this paper, feel free to uh, send me a paper, uh, well, email, and I will send you the paper, <laughs> uh, um, you know, as a reply. Murad Beck, um, are you here? Yes, uh, yes, I'm here. Hello, everyone. Hi, uh, I'm uh, terribly sorry for this uh, uh, joining uh, so late due to some technical issues, but uh, still, uh, I'm very happy to be a part of this presentation. And thanks, you so much for uh, uh, giving this presentation. Um, um, I guess uh, you know it would be uh, nice to see. Uh, some questions and comments. And so we have two ways of doing it. One is uh, by raising the hand. Uh, the other is uh, uh, typing in the chat. And so either is, is fine. Uh, since uh, you know, since we have uh, already Salmaz us saying that has some questions, maybe we begin right here and then we proceed. Uh, Salmaz, yours. I will go ahead despite seeing some hands up there. So my apologies. Um, one thing that really grabbed my attention, Jacob, was that um, you said that um, the traditional methods that women use for cooking uh, is somehow linked to their status. And this is really the first time I hear about this. Uh, can you elaborate a little bit more on that? How, how, is, how is this link possible? Yeah. So, uh, um... I think I, I'm not a full-fledged uh, anthropologist. So um, if we had a, an anthropologist uh, on the team, um, maybe they could provide a um, um, better historical overview of this. But um, our observation observations were that, um, especially with regards to cooking bread, um, cooking bread in a traditional oven in a tandir that is uh, you know, um, um, fueled by either dung cakes or by um, firewood optimally, um, produces bread that is considered to be of superior quality and that this traditional um, method of you know preparing bread which is actually the most important staple food um, in that area um, is very much related to how a woman was uh, perceived to be um, skilled as say housewife whether she was able to prepare and you know wake up in the morning to set up you know the fire um, and and um, you know prepare fresh bread for the, the family. Obviously, when you when you look across the border in Tajikistan, many um, households are using now electric ovens um, to prepare the bread, and even there, the bread is considered to be you know of lesser quality. Um, I believe that these gender norms are perfectly um, uh, fluid, and they can change over time. But it is a process. So um, I think you know. This should not be an argument against electrification. It makes lives so much easier. You don't have to, you know, start in the morning by collecting firewood, by uh, collecting dung, setting up the fire before, you know, um, uh, sunrise, and and um, you know, spend additional time baking bread. You can just do it inside of the home in a safe, uh, you know, way using electric ovens. Um, but the issue is that you first have to also have access to um, the electric ovens. If you look at, you know, like rural areas in Afghanistan, um, with the larger, you know, um, cities being several hours of driving away, which on its own is mostly inaccessible to the general population because of the uh, big distance and the, uh, the no, you know, public transport available. Um, one has to, you know, first provide also the, you know, electric appliances to those households to see those changes materialize. So providing electricity obviously is great, but you need to have also, um, you know, uh, programs that accompany um, the electrification process. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Thanks. Maybe if I can add before you take another question is that um, what we observed was also that um, households who were uh, using electric hot plates, for example, um, did not have the knowledge on how to use, um, on how to save energy. So for example, you would boil water on, on, on this hot plate without any, um, you know, putting a lid on top of the um, um, you know, um, pot. And so you would lose uh, you know, lots of energy in the process, which is costly, which then makes electricity being perceived as something very unattainable and costly because of the inefficient use of it. 
um, the same with turning off lights. Um, it is not a it is not self evident that if if you want to have a lower electricity bill, you need to turn off your lights or you know the continuous use of TV, et cetera, et cetera, unplugging devices. So um, I think you know those interventions are great. They're very beneficial in my view, but they need to come with you know some auxiliary programs to educate people on to how to use electricity in the most efficient uh, way. All right, thanks so much. I guess I can also throw in an additional uh, insight from uh, my research in Khatlon region, which has been electrified since uh, the Soviet times and still uh, bread baking stood out as a special activity is that it's never cooked baked in um, the ovens with electricity. So um, this was uh, attributed by the participants as being a very particularly cultural attribute and um, that uh, it is, uh, you know, lesser quality, all those things, but also culturally, you know, you, you never do that. And uh, we have to be baking the bread inside the, the oven, despite it having electricity and all the knowledge in the Soviet experience and everything. So some of the cultural, um, I guess, um, attributes still uh, persist, even in the face of so-called modernity. Um, okay. Uh, sounds good. Let's move on to our chat. And yes, I can see a couple of hands. Let's uh, start with Raihan. Go ahead, please. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Murad Bek and Jakub. It's really interesting uh, uh, research. And I'm looking forward to for, uh, reading the paper, the actual paper. So my questions are, uh, what, what, is, what was your data collection method? Um, how you collected the data, and I'm also interested in your sample size uh, for making these conclusions. And also, one more question: you mean you mentioned that uh, households with a connection to electricity, to grid connected electricity, are spending twice um, high, higher. That, does this mean that they are spending twice? Um, much money on electricity in compared to using firewood. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe like uh, my connection was not very well, so maybe I did not uh, go to your point very well. But like uh, what I know, like from Pamir Energy current experience, like in from the Tajik side, when uh, in rural communities, household like the expenditure on uh, on firewood in winter, it is it costs much higher in compared to electricity price. Mm. Thank you, Raihan. Um, actually, uh, I'm going to start from the from the end of your question. So um, I was comparing um, the expenditure of uh, households and um, communities that had no grid electricity, but they were expending some of their income on repairs and the maintenance of the um, makeshift uh, either hydropower plants or solar panels or car batteries. So um, what we observed was that um, each of those households, even in those non-electrified uh, communities, had some form of access to electricity. Um, it would be mostly pooled resources. So um, six households would get together and construct a uh, micro hydropower plant. Um, but this hydropower plant um, would need constant repairs and maintenance. It would freeze in the winter and uh, would need to be repaired after the winter, each winter. If you had solar panels, um, you would, uh, you know, uh, they would break, so you'd uh, have to purchase new ones. You, they, they were using car batteries um, to save the energy, but that is very inefficient. So you'd have to, you know, purchase new car batteries, or they were just buying car batteries altogether, just, you know, uh, get some form of electricity. Um, and we compared, so in the statement, uh, we compared just the expenditure on repairs and maintenance to um, the electricity bill that households with grid electricity were paying. You are very right to say that actually, if you were comparing the expenditure on energy altogether, that um, this would be a completely different picture. I think you know you have a, 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 a much more in-depth experience with with uh, energy consumption in the uh, area and. Um, um, if households are actually purchasing, in addition to you know whatever they collect in firewood, 
um, um, at market prices, then yes, obviously the, the expenditure would be uh, much larger. But the thing is that none of the households that, uh, for example, the firewood, if, if we look at firewood, it would mostly probably be for heating. And um, even households that have access to electricity, we're not using electricity to heat because it's uh, a there's low availability of electric heaters and b it's very uh, you know um, energy inefficient. So they were still using um, um, a fire uh, you know um, either gun cakes or firewood to heat their homes. Um, then to your second question, the sample size was 60, which is not representative, and uh, we never claim to uh, you know um, 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 have a representative sample of Shubnan. Um, we interviewed 30 um, households in electrified communities and 30 non-electrified communities. Um, each household having, I think, on average eight um, uh, household members, and we were uh, collecting information on each household member. Um, so yeah, that was our sample size. And the um, last question was regarding the data collection process. So this was done in 2018 in August, and um, it was with in cooperation and with the support of Palmer Energy that this um, a survey was established. Um, there was a um, we had uh, available two translators, one female, one uh, male translator, um, who were um, traveling with us to all those uh, locations and were able to interview men and women separately such, you know, because often it is the case that um, um, women would not feel comfortable to talk to a male enumerator. So hence we had uh, a team of a male and a female enumerator always um, on site um, to conduct interviews with both men and women. Um, so um, I hope this answers your question. If not, then please ask yes. again. Yes, thank you very much. I'm looking forward to reading your paper. Thank you. I'm happy to send it uh, to you. Just uh, let me know if, um, if you need the PDF and I can send you an email with, with the PDF. Yes, I think that would be helpful. Sure. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, Rayhan. Um, we also have another um, hand raised in the chat, George Ambe. Please go ahead. Yeah, thank you so much for this interesting uh, presentation, Jakob. And uh, thank you for bringing this. Uh, I mean, I, I, I have a, a comment and I have a question. Yeah, it's just not a comment, but the, uh, in addition to what you said, that people like prefer using, uh, you know, baking, for example, the bread in the fireplace rather than in the oven. It's also, I mean, uh, you already mentioned about the cultural norms, but also uh, it's about the taste as well. People prefer, you know, uh, you know, to have, you know, the, the bread from the fireplace taste more like tastier than the one which is baked in the oven. So it's one thing, but the another thing I'm just wondering, it's maybe because, I mean, perhaps it's because of not having it, I, am I? No, you're, you're, you're all right, Trisham, but Afsona just uh, joined and um, um, we heard the audio, so please continue. Okay, uh, uh, just my, my, my uh, uh, thing that, for example, because they're not baking it in the oven, but is it that they don't have access to those electrical appliances because it's you know uh, expensive and also uh, lack of kind of training like you know even nowadays when you buy a new technology so you need to kind of to get acquainted with the with the use of this kind of you know uh, new technology so this is one another thing that might kind of be there the issue in that regard but my question is regarding the distribution of electricity because you talk about the electrified communities and the non-electrified communities. And then you mentioned that Pamir Energy is the, uh, the main provider of electricity in that region. Uh, so my question is, uh, these non-electrified communities are because they don't, can't, can't, cannot afford to you know, buy the electricity or is it not like you know, rural areas where you know, the Pamir Energy is not able to kind of you know provide them with electricity 
So um, to answer your question, thank you first so much for joining us uh, and thanks for the question. Um, it is the case that at the time of writing, these areas were not yet um, um, electrified. The, um, the, um, the Palmer Energy started exporting electricity um, many years ago, but it was doing so in, in phases. So you started with, you know, the Shunan district, then you, uh, you know, extended to Ishkashim, to Rushan, to Darwaz, etc. And and hence the communities that uh, we we visited in 2018 were not yet connected to the electricity grid. There were no um, uh, transmission lines and uh, substations built yet that would service those areas. Um, this is constantly changing, and and um, they put. In, they do really incredible work to service um, all of uh, Badakhshan as much as possible. And uh, they even incorporated now a um, sister company, Badakhshan Energy, which will establish uh, hydropower plants on Afghan territory as not to having, um, you know, export electricity from Tajikistan exclusively, but, you know, uh, use local capacities and extend those local capacities to uh, generate uh, energy in, in Afghanistan. Um, does it answer your question? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Perfect. And uh, then, you know, um, reflecting on your uh, comment about, you know, um, the use of, uh, you know, firewood instead of, uh, you know, um, electricity for, for taste. Actually, what we observed is that this is really the case. And it was always considered, you, 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 Rather, you prepare a meal on fire because it's tastier, and then if you have electricity, you can heat it up, for example, you know, like on an electric hot plate. Um, or you have something very simple to prepare. So you, instead of, you know, setting up a fire, because, it, you know, setting up a fire would be a tedious task, you can do so on, on you know, um, on an electric appliance. Um, but definitely what we observed was that there is still this factor of, of taste that is uh, you know, linked to the uh, traditional methods of cooking. Um, obviously, there's also um, other methods. Uh, one cannot, you know, leave out uh, um, gas cookers, for example, which uh, we observed in some households, very few, very few, but they were. And still, it was part of a fuel stacking process. And those who were using gas uh, did not have much um, information about the proper use of gas bombs either. So there was, you know, this safety concern as well. So um, um, in my view, electricity does indeed provide a very safe um, um, way of, of cooking um, um, if it is, you know, electricity that is installed properly um, through, you know, a grid network and not, you know, a makeshift uh, um, hydropower uh, station in the back garden of, you know, five, six houses with, you know, improvised electricity lines uh, hanging all over the house. Um, so, yeah, thank you again. Thank you. Thanks so much. We have another a hand in the chat. So here, floor is yours. Yes. Um, hi guys. Um, good to see you, um, Murad Beck and, and Jacob. I haven't seen Jacob for two years, but last time in Horog. Um, so I'm, I'm Zohir from from Narin Campus. And so my question could be a little bit off topic, but still, uh, let me let me ask that question. So I'm, I've been interested in uh, community relations, border community relations. Um, uh, and uh, I was wondering if you have come across any participant um, uh, who told you that, you know, this, the, the energy that they are receiving from, from the Tajik side is, um, is contributing towards uh, improving or enhancing the um, the border relations uh, you know, uh, among the I'm, I'm just saying on the grassroots level on the community level <clears throat> so that is that is actually uh, one of my questions um so so whether it is it is it is helping building relations uh, with the communities living ar across the border and my second question is that prices like Choshamba said um so uh, prices, as Jacob said, um, they are twice as much as 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 they pay in uh, in the Tajik side. Um, so, isn't it uh, somehow? Um, uh, I know, I'm just I'm just uh, looking at the future. I, I just I'm just thinking that this isn't this 
you know, high prices, uh, aren't high prices um, uh, 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 sort of could be an obstacle in building the relations because um, when I was working in Afghanistan uh, and I just, you know, I worked there for a long time, uh, people said, the community said that um, the prices are very high and they sort of were blaming, um, you know, the, the tantric side. Uh, so isn't this an obstacle in building uh, strong relations, uh, you know, on the grassroots level? Thank you very much. So I'm, I'm, I'm just saying. I'm, I'm just saying that it could be. It could be. It could. The effect could be reversed, right? Sure. Uh, sure. Um, thank first you, Jacob. To, to address the 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 point you're making about prices, I mean, you have to um, picture these communities to be very poor. You, when we look at you know non-electrified communities, only 13% of the household heads were employed. If we look at electrified communities, this number was larger, but it was still very low. It's 27%. Um, they have very little cash income, so whatever they have to pay in cash is expensive. Of course, electricity is being perceived as uh, an expense they have to make, and any expense they have to make is an expense too much. Um, however, you know, putting it in the larger picture, and this is also what um, you know um, can be dealt with with education and and you know information programs. It's a worthwhile expenditure, considering the, all the positive externalities uh, using electricity has that we outline also in the paper. So um, I think you know um, you can work with communities to um, understand that it it is an expenditure but it's an, a worthwhile expenditure. At the same time, from the other side, it also it needs to be understood that if there's no cash income generated and no uh, you know, economic opportunities, no work opportunities in the district or in the area available that um, you know, the on-take uh, of, um, or uptake of you know, electricity use, uh, usage will be very low. Um, on your different question regarding, uh, regarding uh, community relations, cross-border community relations, I think one could write uh, um, a separate paper on this, and uh, part of it is uh, actually part of my PhD. <laughs> so uh, hopefully, in a few um, you know um, months, uh, the first papers will come out um, where I talk about uh, cross-border uh, you know relations. Um, but from this research, what I can tell you about the the um, you know relations is that a few households actually. Um, we're worried that having, you know, being on the receiving end of this equation, um, the Tajik side will always prioritize Tajikistan if it comes to shortages. This electricity is being, you know, uh, generated through hydropower. Hence, if there's a shortage of water, there will be a shortage of electricity. And we saw that, you know, this season, this has been actually the case. Um, and uh, there were major issues in, you know, supplying sufficient energy. Um, all around Tajikistan, that given that they are, you know, across the border, Tajikistan will first prioritize itself in supplying the electricity to themselves. And then if there's something left over, it will get exported to Afghanistan, which is also the case. It's a legitimate uh, concern, but never did I have the impression that this is, um, you know, uh, perceived as um, in, in a negative way. I think it was just a legitimate concern. And hence, you know, uh, what, what Badashan Energy is now doing is to, you know, build capacity in the country, uh, improve transmission lines, improve capacity also on the Tajik side so that exports can grow in the future. So I think um, um, just the fact that, you know, it is a cross-border, uh, you know, initiative does not, you know, um, um, you know that there's no, you know, suspicion or no, no negative feelings attached to this. Um, quite to the contrary, what I would think is that given that you have plenty of, um, um, you know, contact now, thanks to those cross-border initiatives with, you know, um, workers who come um, and cross the border and um, contribute to many different programs, whether it is now, you know, the electrification programs of Pamir Energy or any other of the AKDN, um, you have again contact established between Afghanistan and Tajikistan, which um, everyone who's familiar with the issue has been cut for many decades. 
Um, so in that way, obviously, it is a beneficial factor to uh, create in context how then those relations, um, you know, um, um, develop further. That is a separate topic um, of study and I will not engage with it now. But I hope that this uh, answers your question. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you very much. And I, I'm, I'm just looking forward into um, risk, you know, just um, probably um, reading your paper on, on the uh, cross-border relations because I'm absolutely interested in that. And I just, you know, in a separate email, I'll just, um, I'll just tell you why. But well, it's good to see you, um, Jacob. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. Really appreciate it. Uh, thanks, Or Yes, uh, and please do reach out uh, to Jakob about this topic. I think you've got uh, a lot in common in there, especially given that- Absolutely, there. absolutely. So, yeah. Thank so, you. Sounds good. Um, okay. Um, <clears throat> I don't see any other hands in the chat, and we are almost close to the end. It's, we've got five more minutes. Um, just curious if anyone else has any comments or questions? All right, so looks like no. Um, I guess uh, using the privilege of the moderator, I will ask uh, one question uh, with regards to the impacts. Uh, as, as, as moderator and co-offer. <laughs> no, 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 not as co-offer. <laughs> As a, as, as a moderator, right? So I, I did actually reach out to the Pamir Energy folks, uh, alerting them that uh, this lecture is happening. And uh, quite honestly, I'm surprised no one joined. And so this is uh, where uh, my question is right now. We academics write these papers, uh, you know, and in this case, your case is a little bit more unique since you actually worked with them to collect this data. Um, and so I'm curious about if any impact whatsoever arising from this study, if not from this paper, obviously it's, uh, it's now, but um, um, probably after this study was conducted, if you could share any insights whatsoever. Thanks. I think um, it's a continuous process and um, there are many initiatives going on that are evaluating the situation and the interventions that Palmer Energy is doing. And this was part of it. And I think um, they are being considered and reevaluated. Um, one thing that I think I need to admit is, uh, you know, myself is that I'm an outsider, obviously. Um, and there's people who are, you know, spending years and years and years and years living in those areas. They're born there, they're, you know, uh, it is part of their daily reality. And I think um, rather than, you know, considering only, you know, academic evidence that gets published in, you know, um, a British uh, journal, uh, the experience of uh, locals who are, you know, exposed um, to these experiences is um, more important than, or, you know, um, at least equally as important as, uh, as, as, as ac academic studies. And I very much appreciate that um, those, that there are people who are concerned with those issues and um, you know, provide an emic experience or you know, perspective on, on things. Okay, very politically correct. Well, uh, thanks so much again for the presentation and uh, thanks the um, audience uh, for joining us, uh, for asking uh, very insightful questions. Um, and uh, we have our next uh, faculty lecture series. Um, I believe uh, uh, it's uh, Vasila and uh, Solmaz. Um, yeah, I can see it in the chat. Thanks uh, for um, sharing this. So it's on the millennial erosion rates across the Pamir in Western Tianshan. So something from the hard sciences. Finally, we get something really hard and the geology is also there. So we look forward to that. Please do tune in. Watch out for the announcement and many thanks again for joining us. Uh, have a nice uh, rest of your day.